The Theory of Need in Marx by Agnes Heller. This is chapter four, Radical Needs. Marx always attributes positive values to communism and constantly contrasts them with the alienated character of past values, those of prehistory and particularly those of capitalism. This attribution of value by Marx is characterized subjectively by ought, communism should be realized, but from the very beginning, Marx is also forced to surmount this ought, the subjectivity of ought, theoretically. He finds two ways of doing this. They are not always differentiated, but they can be. The first is the transformation of the subject into the collectivity. The ought itself is collective because at the maximum point of capitalism, alienation or capitalist alienation, it stimulates certain needs among the masses and particularly among the proletariat. These are the radical needs which embody this ought in which by their very nature tend to transcend capitalism and precisely in the direction of communism. The second way is the transformation of ought into causal necessity. Communism should be realized is, in this case, a principle synonymous with the idea that it will necessarily be realized by the inherent laws of the economy. It might be said that sometimes it is a, a fictian conception which prevails in Marx and sometimes a Hegelian one. Both, of course, are inverted. This fluctuating attitude is expressed inter alia when Marx oscillates between a conception of economic laws as laws of nature and the contrary conception. In the well-known preface of 1867 to the first volume of Capital, he writes of his standpoint as one from which the evolution of the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of, of natural history. It only needs to be added that in the postscript to the second edition, 1873, he draws our attention to his conscious use of the Hegelian method. Not so well known are the observations that contradict this position. In the third volume of Theories of Surplus Value, Marx writes that when capitalism comes to be analyzed historically, the illusion of regarding the economic laws of a social formation as natural laws of production vanishes. And even in the first volume of Capital, he speaks of a law of capitalist accumulation, metamorphosed by economists into a pretended law of nature. It might be objected that the process of natural history and law of nature are not synonymous, but the objection is not valid because in the preface that has been quoted, one can already read in so many words, the expression law of nature in a context which is for us particularly important, the context of the historical perspective. And even when a society has got on the right track for the discovery of the natural laws of its movement, it can neither clear by bold leaps nor remove by legal enactments the obstacles offered by the successive phases of its normal development but it can shorten and lessen the birth pangs. We shall see that there is an analogous interpretation for the negation of the negation. In his letter to the editors of Otekhetsvenyi Zabiski, Marx again raises doubts about the naturalistic interpretation. And in his rough notes for a letter replying to Vera Zasulik, he writes about the possibility of reaching communism by a circuitous route jumping over capitalism. Thus, there also exists the possibility of jumping some stages of development. Primitive accumulation is not therefore a general law, and the proletarianization of the peasantry is not a necessity. Indeed, proletarianization of the peasantry, oh sorry, indeed Marx writes with a tone of resignation. If Russia continues to tread the path on which it has traveled since 1861, it will lose the finest opportunity that history has ever offered a people, 
and will experience all the inevitably circuitous journeyings through the regime of capitalism. As so often when he is examining concrete historical problems, Marx substitutes the concept of alternatives for that of necessity. In the other conception, however, the category of possibility occupies as small a position as it does in the Hegelian conception of economic law. In order to understand this and the central problem of radical needs, we must briefly consider Marx's conception of the social totality. Every social formation is a total whole, a unity of structures coherently linked to each other and constructed interdependently. There is no causal relationship between these structures. No one of them is the cause or the consequence of another. They are only able to function as parts of an interdependent arrangement. In the poverty of philosophy, Marx formulates this as follows. The production relations of every society from a whole, form a whole. Mr. Proudhon considers economic relations as so many social phases engender, <coughs> engendering one another, resulting one from the other, like the antithesis from the thesis and realizing in their logical sequence the impersonal reason of humanity. How indeed could the single logical formula of movement, of sequence, of time, explain the structure of society in which all relations coexist simultaneously and support one another? In the introduction to a critique of political economy, explaining the problems of production, exchange, and consumption, Marx concludes, the conclusion we reach is not that production, distribution, exchange, and consumption are identical, but that they all form the members of a totality, distinctions within a unity. And in the Grundrys, he says, forces of production and social relations are two different sides of the development of the social individual. Also, in the well-known passage in which he deals in detail with the relation between the economic base and ideological forms, Marx concerns, concerns himself with the reciprocal composition of these structures. The life processes of society manifest themselves in the superstructure, since the moments of the latter bring out the conflicts of the base. Now, from our point of view, why is the conception of the social totality, the formation, important? It is because this conception makes it possible to locate the foundations of the collective ought or the collective ought in being. For the present, let us briefly say that one of the essential interdependent structures of capitalism as formation is the, is the structure of need. To be able to function in the form characteristic of Marx's epoch, to be able to subsist as social formation, capitalism had to have within its structure of need certain needs that were not satisfiable internally. According to Marx, radical needs are inherent aspects of the capitalist structure of need. Without them, as we have said, capitalism cannot function, so it creates them afresh every day. Radical needs cannot be eliminated from capitalism because they are necessary to its functioning. They are not the embryos of a future formation, but members of the capitalist formation. It is not the being of radical needs that transcends capitalism, but their satisfaction. Those individuals for whom the radical needs are um, needs already arise in capitalism are the bearers of the collective ought. In order to deepen the discussion of this problem, it is, however, also necessary to analyze the antinomies of capitalism. Naturally, the two kinds of transformation of ought, which we have traced back to Fecht and Hegel respectively, also find we have traced back to Fichte and he oh, fuck, also find expression in the theory of the antinomies of capitalism. Naturally, because the problem of what are the opposites to be surmounted and the problem of how to surmount them are organically connected. We begin with the Hegelian conception of antinomy, which is better known and also easier. Let us refer to two unambiguous passages one from the preface of the Critique of Political Economy, the other from the first volume of Capital. 
Analogous formulations are to be found in the Communist Manifesto and in passages of anti during in which Engels explains Marx's conception. In the preface, he writes, At a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production, or this merely expresses the same thing in legal terms with the property relations within the framework of which they have operated hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters. Marx explains a general law here, which is valid for every social formation, though elsewhere he is opposed to the formulation of social laws of universal validity. In every social formation, relations of production are first established, which correspond to the level of development of the productive forces, in which, for a certain period, contribute to the development of the productive forces. But subsequently, oppositions develop that lead to contradiction, whereby the relations of production become fetters on the productive forces. Here, the point is to invert the Hegelian conception of contradiction, and thus to change it. The course of development of the forces and relations of production in every social formation would accordingly be correspondence, opposition, contradiction. In the first book of Capital, in the chapter on the historical tendency of capitalist accumulation, Marx shows how capitalism developed the productive forces and how, in parallel, the oppositions within this society have unfolded. He concludes as follows. The monopoly of capital becomes a fetter upon the mode of production, which has sprung up and flourished along with and under it. Centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor at last reach a point where they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. This integument is burst asunder. The knell of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated. The capitalist mode of appropriation, the result of the capitalist mode of production, produces capitalist private property. This is the first negation of individual private property as founded on the labor of the proprietor. But capitalist production begets, with the inexorability of a law of nature, its own negation. It is the negation of negation. This does not reestablish private property for the producer but gives him individual property based on the acquisitions of the capitalist era, i.e. on cooperation and the possession in common of the land and of the means of production produced by labor itself. This passage describes the phases of capitalist development as follows. For a certain period, capitalism develops the productive forces to an extraordinary degree through the socialization of production. Then the socialized productive forces and the relations of production enter into contradiction. This contradiction sharpens, becomes irreconcilable, and finally reaches the point at which the centralization of the means of production breaks the shell of capitalism. The capitalist mode of production brings about its own negation with the necessity of natural process. Of course, capitalism does not collapse of its own accord. It is overturned by the proletariat. But this overturning is necessary because of capitalism's economic dysfunction. Quite rightly, Marx denies having simply adapted the Hegelian model to his own way of thinking, and asserts that he is using it only to express his own conceptions. We have seen that this assertion is valid. In fact, Marx's theory of contradiction can be traced back to Hegel simply in the sense that the Hegelian formula is an adequate mode of expression for it. But what is the role of radical needs in this conception? In the context which I have already quoted, Marx writes, with reference to these words, to sorry, with reference to these needs, along with the constantly diminishing number of the magnates of capital, grows the mass of misery, oppression, slavery, degradation, exploitation. But with it too grows the revolt of the working class, a class always increasing in numbers and disciplined, united, organized by the very mechanism of the process of capitalist production itself. However one reads this passage, the theory of absolute impoverishment is clearly formulated. Poverty grows with the development of capitalism. 
At the same time, the theme of radical needs also emerges. We are thus confronted with the most paradoxical possible articulation of the paradox to which we have referred. If the negation of the negation were a natural law, no kind of radical need whatever would be necessary for the downfall of capitalism. These passages from Capital clearly demonstrate that Marx, in the Hegelian sense, objectivized ought in social necessity, or rather in economic necessity, thus removing precisely its character as ought. The generalization of the Hegelian theory of contradiction into a global social law is, of course, only a consequence of this. The fact that the contradiction between the productive forces and the relations of production where the latter are smashed by the development of the former, appears in every society, or in every so society is the historical demonstration of the necessity for capitalism to collapse. It should be added that Marx here is ruthlessly consistent, more so than Engels, about there always being another possibility, i.e. the ruin of the productive forces. Since the manifesto is a jointly written work, we cannot refer to it in this, con in this connection. The capitalist mode of the production, or the capitalist mode of production more and more completely transforms the great majority of the population into proletarians. It creates the power which, under penalty of its own destruction, is forced to accomplish this revolution. The fact that Engels poses the alternative here is without a doubt a merit on his part but there is still a certain one-sidedness in his conception. Of Marx's two theories of contradiction, Engels, in fact, accepts only one exclusively, the Hegelian version. Hence, this is the only one in which he can find room for practice. But Marx had an additional, fundamentally different theory of contradiction, which is of no less significance. The second conception of contradiction cannot be generalized with reference to past history. Marx himself several times underlines the point that it cannot be generalized. For example, in the first volume of Capital, in the chapter on commodity fetishism. According to this conception, the antinomies that are expressed in capitalism are the contradictions of advanced commodity production and the structure of the first part of the first volume of Capital, commodities, money, capital, is founded upon the unfolding of precisely these antinomies. The commodity is use value and exchange value. From the very beginning, from the moment at which, pro at which products are turned into commodities, these develop oppositions of a contradictory character. The commodity is not the unity of opposites, but the form in which the opposites move. The commodity form is the embryo of the antinomies of capitalism, and these contradictions are already contained in the embryo itself. In the production of commodities, human relations assume the form of relations between things. Social existence becomes fetishized in the thing. Social relations fetishized in a thing confront individual human beings in the form of economic laws, laws of nature, as it were. The functioning of social power is mystified into a law of nature. All the different kinds of private labor, which are carried on independently of each other, and yet as spontaneously developed branches of the social division of labor are continually being reduced to the quantitative proportions in which society requires them. And why? Because in the midst of all the accidental and ever fluctuating exchange relations between the products, the labor time socially necessary for their production forcibly asserts itself like an overriding law of nature. However, this mystified expression of economic laws in the form of natural laws is precisely and exclusively the consequence of commodity production, its inner essence. The value form of the product of labor is not only the most abstract, but is also the most universal form, taken by the product in the bourgeois mode of production. If then we treat this mode of production as one eternally fixed by nature, for every state of society, we necessarily overlook the specificity of the value form, and consequently of the commodity form, and of its further developments, money form, capital form, etc. These are the forms which 
bear it stamped upon them in unmistakable letters that they belong to a state of society in which the process of production has the mastery over man instead of being controlled by him. Before starting to analyze the antinomies of commodity production, I want to emphasize the fact that this conception logically contradicts any statement that the realization of the society of associated producers is a law of nature. The functioning of the economy in the guise of natural law belongs in fact to commodity production and only to it as an expression of commodity fetishism. The positive overcoming of private property cannot therefore in any way proceed in the form of a natural necessity. The essence of this process is the overcoming of fetishism and the revolutionary liquidation of the appearance which social existence has of being a quasi law of nature. Although it has economic aspects, the transition cannot be a purely economic process, but must be a total social revolution and is only conceivable as such. For Marx, the specific antinomies of capitalism which derive from commodity production are those between freedom and necessity, necessity and chance, teleology and causality. From these follows the specific or the special antinomy of social wealth and social impoverishment. These are the antinomies of the pure society in which economic development assumes the status of natural law and in which, to recall capital once again, man is subordinated to the process of production and not the process of production to man. First, let us consider the antinomy of freedom and necessity in commodity production. The producer is a free man, a man who has cut the umbilical cord of the natural community. Commodity exchange itself is an act of freedom and equality. Every producer of commodities freely pursues his own private interest. We refer once again to the passage in Marx. If, when he exchanges his commodity, he exchanges like for like. Marx says the same thing about wage labor. The wage laborer is free. Without free labor power, capitalist accumulation could never have started. One of the functions of primitive accumulation was that of bringing free labor onto the market. However, the free commodity producer and the free laborer are equally subordinated to the quasi-natural necessity of the economy, which asserts itself behind the backs of the free actions of individual human beings. Oh no. This antagonism is part of the essence of commodity production, i.e. of capitalism, from the first moment of its appearance. Let us look briefly at the antinomy of necessity and chance. Marx associates the law of value, according to which value is defined by the social ne necessary labor time, not exclusively with capitalism, but with every society in which the sphere of production is rational. The law of value, therefore, will assume its most pure form in the society of associated producers. In the third volume of Capital, Marx writes, This reduction of the total quantity of labor going into a commodity seems, accordingly, to be the essential criterion of increased productivity of labor, no matter under what social conditions production is carried on. Productivity of labor indeed would always be measured by the standard in a society in which producers regulate their production according to a preconceived plan. This economic law which characterizes rational production is manifested in capitalism as a natural law, that is, as a law of chance. Recall the quotation from the first volume of Capital quoted earlier. Since the value of the commodity in exchange functions as exchange value, Profit, average profit in the market price, as apparently different forms, hide and mystify the same law of value. In this context, it is important to note that production and need meet on the market in the form of supply and demand, and that this meeting comes about in an altogether chance way. It is equally possible that they do not meet. In this event, the law of value is again confirmed as a natural law, but it takes the form of crisis. 
People in capitalist society are accidental individuals, not born into any natural division of labor. Their destiny is not predetermined from birth. However, given the structure of capitalist society, they are subordinated to a kind of social division of labor that, as we have already said, allocates their needs. Needs which are no longer determined by their personality, but by their position in the social division of labor. At the same time, their capacities, senses, etc. are also divided by the social division of labor. Now let us consider the antinomy of causality and teleology. Engels, following in the footsteps of Hegel, describes the dialectic between human activity and its consequences, by which everyone sets out to realize his own individual ends, but the result is something completely different from what the individual originally wanted to achieve. He presents, in a fundamental manner, the contradictory character of commodity-producing society. The fact that he does not recognize it as such, but consi considers it to be the general dialectical character of the historical process, spotlights the Hegelian foundations of his position. What does the individual capitalist want? What is his goal? He wants the realization of exchange values, more precisely, to make a profit. And what does the worker want? He wants to survive. These aims are what set the laws of capitalism in motion behind the back of human beings and the aims which they set for themselves. Even the, even the raising of production is not the aim of an individual. The formula of production for production's sake, which Marx deals with so extensively, is not only a highly... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's not only a highly scientific formula, it is also a value judgment taken from Ricardo. On the basis of this formula, Ricardo justifies capitalism because it effectively develops the productive forces. All the same, for the purpose of regulating the mechanism of capitalism, it is not the principle production for production's sake that counts, but the principle production for the sake of valorizing capital. Marx's finest concrete analysis concerning the antinomy of causality and teleology is to be found in the law of the, fa the falling average rate of profit. No individual capitalist aims at lowering the average rate of profit, but in order to further his actual aim to make a profit and to survive under conditions of competition, he must keep increasing his fixed capital and thus constantly submit to the process that causally leads to the continuous lowering of the average rate of profit. In capitalist society, the individual teleology can never become the social teleology. Finally, as regards the special antinomy of wealth and poverty, which characterizes capitalism in particular, let us let Marx speak for himself. Ricardo, rightly for his time, regards the capitalist mode of production as the most advantageous for production in general, as the most advantageous for the creation of wealth. He wants production for the sake of production, and this with good reason. To assert that, the, that production as such is not the object, is to forget that production for its own sake means nothing but the development of human productive forces. In other words, the development of the richness of human nature as an end in itself. They reveal a failure to understand the fact that, although at first the development of the capacities of the human species take place at the cost of the majority of the human individuals and even classes, in the end it breaks through this contradiction and coincides with the development of the individual. The higher development of individuality is thus only achieved by a historical process during which individuals are sacrificed. This discussion here clearly does not turn upon alienation in general, but on capitalist alienation in particular. The alienation of the pure, pure society in which commodity relations have become universal and capitalism has liberated the productive forces. For the moment, what interests us in particular is the resolution of the antinomy of the problem of transition to the society of the future. What does Marx say? It will be the development of the capacities of the human species, 
that breaks through this antagonism. But is this concept synonymous with the centralization of the means of production and the socialization of labor, which appear in the passage quoted from the first volume of Capital? The answer is, without a doubt, no. The development of the human species is a much broader concept than the others. I lost my spot. And it is not, of course, a mere consequence of the centralization of the means of production and the socialization of labor. Moreover, there is no question, moreover, there is no question here, nor in any of the other passages where this conception of the antinomy is under discussion of any natural law that leads society into the future. The necessity of the transition is not in fact guaranteed by any natural law, but by the radical needs. If Marx said that with his first theory of contradiction he inverted the dialectic of Hegel, we can justifiably say that with the second he inverted the antinomies of Fichte. The antinomies of freedom and necessity, chance and necessity, causality and teleology, subject and object, are not antinomies in thought but in being. Nor are they simply antinomies in social being but rather in commodity producing society and in capitalism in particular. According to this interpretation, the dialectic is merely the expression of the antinomies in capitalist society. Following Marx, Lucas interpreted the dialectic in this way in both history and class consciousness and the young Hegel. These then are capitalism's antinomies in being. The capitalist social body finds expression in them. In the poverty of philosophy, Marx ironically rejects Proudhon's proposal to get rid of the bad aspects of capitalism and keep the good. The structures of the capitalist formation are interdependent. It is impossible to reject some and keep others. The specific freedom, which stands in a contradictory relation to necessity, is not the same as the specific freedom, which does not stand in contradictory relation to necessity. The same applies to necessity in relation to chance and to teleology in relation to causality. Finally, the specific subject which develops a contradictory relation to its object is not the same as that which reabsorbs its object into itself and which brings about the subject-object identity. We know in fact that not until the human species breaks through capitalist alienation and the antagonistic development of subject and object does the development of the species coincide with that of the individual. It is interesting to note the arguments in the poverty of philosophy from this point of view, where Marx examines every aspect of Proudhon's writing, even down to observing the latter's order of exposition. After the concept of formation, there follows an important mode of formulation of the radical needs as the need for universality, which Marx regards as particularly important. The reasoning concludes as follows. Meanwhile, the antagonism between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie is a struggle of class against class, a struggle which carried to its highest expression is a total revolution. That is to say, where there are no good sides to preserve in opposition to the bad sides, where the oppositions are reciprocally arranged and interdependent, total revolution is the only way of transcending this opposing pair. All this proves what we have been saying up to now. The idea that the transition from capitalism to communism is an objective law of nature is incompatible with Marx's second theory of contradiction. According to this theory, only, only the revolutionary struggle of the collective subject, the working class, having become such by virtue of its radical needs and revolutionary practice, can guarantee the transition to and creation of the future society. I've used the word guarantee deliberately. It is a guarantee in the actual sense of the word. Communism follows from Marx's second theory of contradiction, no, no less necessarily than from his first. In the second theory too, Marx has given ought an objective existence, as we have already said, not as natural law, but as the collective ought. 
only the struggle of the collective subject is capable of bringing about the new society. Its revolution is radical from the root in total. But the collective ought arises necessarily for the social body of capitalism itself necessarily generates the radical needs and their bearers. The fact that in Marx's time these radical needs had not yet become actual, at least not on a mass scale, and that Marx therefore had to invent them, so to speak, does not disprove the theory. Consider how today we can see with our own eyes the emergence of such radical needs. It does not detract from Marx's greatness that the bearers of these radical needs today are not, or rather not exclusively, the working class. Marx could only construct radical needs where he saw some possibilities for their development. Another problem was presented by the fact that for us today, the simple assigning of ought to the sphere of objectivity, i.e. the idea of the necessity of revolutionary action, cannot be accepted, for we, for we would at least have to add Engels' qualification on pain of death. I have said that in this society of associated producers which Marx foresaw, the above-mentioned antinomies cease to exist, and that the way to overcome um, sorry, the way to overcome them is total revolution. How, in Marx's view, is communist society shaped from the point of view of overcoming these particular antinomies? I shall deal with it only in a few words here because the analysis of the system of needs in the society of associated producers will come later. When the opposition between subject and subject ceases, as we have already seen, the wealth of the species and the wealth of the individual coincide, i.e. the wealth of the species is represented by every separate individual. The realm of production, the organic interchange between society and nature, remains the realm of necessity, but necessity is subordinated to freedom. Social relations between human beings then become free relations. Mankind socialized in freedom dominates the realm of necessity and regulates it, controls it. The law of value does not assert itself on the market, hence the aspect of chance is eliminated from the economy. Human beings no longer have a chance relationship with society. As socialized individuals, they represent the human species for itself. Teleology has dominance over causality. The associated intelligence of the associated producers embodies social teleology. No quasi-natural force makes itself felt behind the backs of people from the dispositions of the collective teleology. What people really want emerges. The subordination to which we refer will be possible only because the freedom, necessity, teleology, and social wealth of the future society are not the same, sorry, are not the same freedom, necessity, teleology, and wealth as in capitalist society. The future society in every aspect of its structure is fundamentally different from capitalist society and hence it can only come about in total revolution. However, it is obviously the capitalist development of the productive forces that generates the possibility of this revolution. This latter feature is common to both of Marx's conceptions of contradiction. One observation seems necessary here. In my own view, it has been sufficiently proved that in Marx there are two kinds of theory of contradiction, which are mutually exclusive in principle. But this does not mean that there are no passages in Marx's work where the two conceptions appear together, wherein dealing with one theory of contradiction, considerations deriving from the other are also used. There are actually several such examples. I have already drawn attention to it. We saw that in The Negation of the Negation, there is an echo of the radical needs motif, though in this particular context the motif was not essential. The fact that Marx held two differing theories of contradiction is not a defect in his thought. On the contrary, it is a striking proof of his genius. Like every other thinker of importance, he too refused to sacrifice the search for truth in various directions and along various paths on the altar of coherence. He pinpointed various possibilities of finding a solution and considered every one of them with the consistency that is characteristic of genius. 
to refurbish Marx into a thinker who worked out a coherent system means to deprive him of precisely the main source of his greatness, his feverish and many-sided search for truth. It is characteristic of a great thinker that he not only creates important impulses, but that these impulses point in many directions. The immortality, the living content of, content of Marx's thought, which transcends historical epochs, is based precisely upon this brilliant lack of coherence. For this reason, it is always possible to rediscover him. For this reason, many different movements, which however are all of world historical importance, can consider Marx as their precursor, as their own. His work is a clear and exhaustible fountain. The conception of radical needs appears for the first time in a detailed form in the introduction to the proposed version of a critique of Hegel's philosophy of law. If we look at this conception in the course of its birth, we can catch it red-handed. We can see how far Marx gives ought an objective existence when he says that pure theoretical critique is realized in activity, in tasks for whose solution there is, only, there is one means only, practice. The reference goes further. The weapon of criticism obviously cannot replace the criticism of weapons. Material force must be overthrown by material force. But theory also becomes the material force once it has gripped the masses. Theory is capable of gripping the masses when it demonstrates ad hominem, and it demonstrates ad hominem when it becomes radical. To be radical is to grasp things by the root, but for man the root is man himself. Marx measures the radicalism of theory in terms of the way it attributes value, i.e. its value premise. Theory is radical to the extent that man, human wealth, represents the highest value. I do not consider this value premise to be characteristic only of the younger Marx, as I have already pointed out several times. We need only look at the third volume of Theories of Surplus Value, where Marx quotes the expression used by Galliani, true wealth is man and praises with enthusiasm rare for him the sublime idealism of the proletarian ideology expressed there. The problem is, however, as follows. How can radical theory become practice? How can it grip the masses? How can the values of radical criticism um, become the values of the masses? Fuck. I lost my spot. How can the values of radical criticism become the values of the masses? That is, how can ought become the collective ought? The reply is, theory is actualized in a people only insofar as it actualizes their needs. A deep going revolution can only be a revolution in basic needs. The barriers of radical needs are therefore those who can actualize radical deep going theory. Marx then looks for the bearers of these radical needs and in the end, he finds them in the working class. He bases his conclusion on the fact that it is a class with radical chains, a class in civil society that is not of civil society, a sphere, a sphere of society having a universal character because of its universal suffering and claiming no particular right because no particular wrong, but unqualified wrong is perpetrated on it. A sphere that can invoke no traditional title, but only a human title. The working class therefore embodies radical needs, because it has no particular goals of its own, nor can it have any, since its goals, by the very fact of being the working class's goals, can only be general. Later on, Marx speak, speaks again of this idea, for example in the Communist Manifesto, saying that the working class cannot free itself without freeing humanity as a whole. The Communist Manifesto is, on the other hand, also the work in which the, co the concept of class interest is introduced. Since it was written jointly by Marx and Engels, I have not taken it, in, taken it into consideration in my analysis of interest. If indeed it is right to say, and in my opinion it is, that the working class can free itself only by freeing humanity too. It does not follow from this, however, that in terms of historical reality, the working class actually wishes to free itself, and that its needs are in fact radical needs. Nor does it even follow that it has no particular goals, particular needs. 
which it can realize or satisfy within capitalist society. As we have seen, Marx himself speaks later on of these particular interests in relation to the struggle for wages. He contrasts the particular struggle for wage increases with the general struggle to abolish the wages system and to satisfy radical needs. Remember also that in Marx's view, what characterizes the working class is both its reduction of paltry or reduction to paltry particular needs and interests, and at the same time, the rise of radical needs. In his subsequent writings, In his subsequent writings, Marx no longer seeks the origin of radical needs, either in radical chains or in the absence of particular goals. But the essence of his viewpoint remains un unchanged. It is based on the fact that capitalist society itself gives rise to radical needs, thus producing its own grave diggers, and that these needs are an organic constituent part of the social body of capitalism, thus being unsatisfiable within that society. For precisely this reason, they are the motives of the practice which transcends the given society. In the German ideology, radical needs are founded on what for the proletariat has accidentally become labor, over which the individual proletarians have no control, and over which no social organization can give any control. And the, contra and the contradiction between the personality of the individual proletarian and the condition of life that is imposed upon him, labor, is clear to the proletarian himself. It emerges clearly from this quotation that the idea of radical needs proceeds from Marx's second theory of contradiction. According to Marx, therefore, the worker becomes conscious of the contradiction between the need to develop his personality and the accidental character of his subordination to the division of labor. For this very reason, proletarians, in order to make themselves felt as persons, must abolish their own conditions of existence as they have been up to the present, which at the same time are the conditions of existence for all society up to the present time, namely labor, or read wage labor. So they find themselves also in direct antagonism with the form in which individuals in society have up to now found their collective expression, the state, and they must overturn the state to express their own personality. It is necessary to observe that in this passage, the word must appears twice, and on both occasions is stressed. This necessity is not, however, that of objectively natural economic laws, but of subjective action, of collective activity, of practice. The idea that radical needs are in some sense constituted from labor runs like a thread through Marx's work, either because surplus labor performed for its own sake becomes need or because of the increase in free time, which gives rise to radical needs and to the need for still more free time, or because of the need for universality, which having arisen in the form of mass production cannot be satisfied within capitalism. The need for free time is, in Marx's view, an elemental one, because it always thrusts beyond the limits of alienation. In the first volume of Capital and elsewhere, the struggle for more free time, for a decrease in labor time, constantly appears within the focus of the proletarian class struggle. There is here, therefore, an antinomy, law against law, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchange. It is force that decides between equal laws. Hence the fact that in the history of capitalist production, the determination of the length of the working day presents itself as the result of a struggle for its limitation, a struggle between the collective capitalist, i.e. the capitalist class, and the collective laborer, i.e. the working class. While the wage struggle, according to Marx, is conducted for the particular interests of the proletariat, the struggle for free time transcends particular interests and contains in principle that which conforms to the needs of the species. He proudly draws attention to the fact that when workers were asked in the course of a sociological survey whether they wanted more wages or more free time, the great majority opted for the latter. Of course, he does not deny that the struggle for free time can also remain within the framework of capitalism. 
but it is precisely the laws regulating commodity exchange that give rise to the equal laws between which force decides. At the same time, he is convinced that from a certain point onwards, capitalism is incapable of shortening labor time any further. The need for free time then becomes, in principle, a radical need, which can only be satisfied with the transcendence of capitalism. When related to the need for free time, the character of radical needs is brought out in a particularly striking manner. It is produced by capitalism itself, by its contradictory character, and thus belongs to the very functioning of capitalism. The reduction of labor time compels capitalists to increase their productivity constantly and to give priority to relative rather than absolute surplus value. This basically represents a specific peculiarity of the capitalist production of surplus value. At the same time, need itself mobilizes the working class into transcending capitalism. The same applies to the need for universality. In the German ideology, this idea is still openly formulated with its characteristic of ought. The need for universality must come about because only people who have become possessed of the need and the capacity for universality are capable of a total revolution. Private property can be abolished only on condition of an all-round development of individuals because the existing character of intercourse and productive forces is an all-round one and only individuals that are developing in an all-round fashion can appropriate them, i.e. can turn them into free manifestations of their lives. But in the poverty of philosophy, Marx no longer refers to ought. The need for universality has already come about in capitalism. The radical need to transcend capitalism already exists. What characterizes the division of labor in the automatic workshop is that labor has there completely lost its specialized character. But the moment every special development stops, the need for universality, the tendency towards an integral development of the individual begins to be felt. Marx expresses the same idea in the first volume of Capital. The machine that dominates in capitalist society makes the development of a universality of capacities indispensable. But while in capitalist society, this tendency asserts itself as a natural law. The capitalist division of labor nevertheless serves as a barrier to the development of universality. In order to realize this universality, no longer as a natural law asserting itself behind the backs of human beings, the working class must conquer political power and overcome the division of labor. But if, on the one hand, the variation of work at present imposes itself after the manner of an overpowering natural law, and with the blindly destructive action of a natural law that meets with resistance at all points, modern industry, on the other hand, through its catastrophes, imposes the necessity of recognizing as a fundamental law of production the variation of work, and consequently fitness of the laborer for varied work, and consequently the greatest possible development of his varied aptitudes. It becomes a question of life and death for society to adapt to the mode of production, to the normal functioning of this law. Modern industry indeed compels society under penalty of death to replace the, the detail worker of today, crippled by lifelong repetition of one in the same trivial operation, and thus reduced to the mere fragment of a man by the fully developed individual fit for a variety of laborers, of laborers ready to face any change of production, and to whom the different social functions he performs are but so many modes of giving free scope to his own natural and acquiring powers. There can be no doubt that when the working class comes into power, as inevitably it must, technical instruction, both theoretical and practical, will take its proper place in the working class schools. There is also no doubt that such revolutionary ferments, the final result of which is the abolition of the old division of labor, are diametrically opposed to the capitalist form of production, and to the economic status of the laborer corresponding to that form. Undoubtedly, Marx here is raising only one aspect of the problem of radical needs, giving a meaning to the concept that is more limited than, than in the previously quoted passages. 
but the mature Marx does not consider radical needs only from this point of view. Moreover, he deals with the same problem in relation to the dissolution of the family, barely two pages after the passage quoted, where he says that capitalism dissolves the Germano-Christian family form as a combination of working personnel composed of individuals of both sexes and all ages, which must, under the relevant conditions, become a source of humane development. Although in its spontaneously developed, brutal capitalistic form, where the laborer exists for the process of production and not the process of production for the laborer, it is a pestiferous source of corruption and slavery. It would be a mistake, however, to think that the mature Marx relates the structure of radical needs exclusively to modern industrial production. In the Grand Race, the idea of radical needs has a more universal character than in any of the early, earlier works. He maintains there that capitalist alienation itself gives rise to radical needs because of the very consciousness of alienation. The material which it works on, Marx is referring here to subjective labor capacity, not to the workers, is alien material. The instrument is likewise an alien instrument. Its labor appears as a mere accessory to their substance and hence objectifies itself in things not belonging to it. Indeed, living, living labor itself appears as alien vis-a-vis vis -vis living labor cap, uh, capacity, whose labor it is, whose own life's expression it is. Labor capacity relates to its labor as to an alien, and if capital were willing to pay it without making it labor, it would enter the bargain with pleasure. Thus, labor capacity's own um, labor is an alien to it, and it really is, as regards its direction, etc., as our material and instrument, which is why the product then appears to it as a combination of alien material, alien instrument, and alien labor, as alien property, the recognition of the products as its own, and the judgment that its separation from the conditions of its realization is improper, forcibly imposed, is a consciousness which exceeds its bounds, itself the product of the mode of production resting on capital, and as much the knell to its doom as, with the slave's consciousness that he cannot be the property of another, with his consciousness of himself as a person, the existence of slavery becomes a merely artificial vegetative existence, and ceases to be able to prevail at the basis of production. Here, every aspect of Marx's conception appears clearly and unequivocally. One, capitalism is an antinomous society. Its essence is alienation. The wealth of the species and the poverty of the individual are reciprocally, be reciprocally based and reproduce each other. The antinomy is that of commodity production becoming universal. At the beginning of the paragraph quoted, the paragraph quoted, Marx says, Value having become capital and living labor confronting it as a mere as mere use value, so that living labor appears as a mere means to realize objectified dead labor, and having produced as the end product alien wealth on the one side, and on the other the penury which is living labor capacity's sole possession. Two capitalist Sorry, capitalist society as a totality, as a social body, produces not only alienation, but the consciousness of alienation, in other words, radical needs. Three, the consciousness, radical needs, is necessarily generated by capitalism. For this consciousness, the complex of radical needs, already transcends capitalism by its existence, and its development makes its development makes it possible for capitalism to remain the basis of production. The need to resolve the antinomy and the activity directed towards this end are therefore constituted in the collective ought, in the consciousness that exceeds its bounds. This concept of consciousness exceeding its bounds is beyond question the same as the imputed consciousness, which is a central category in Lucas's history in cl class consciousness. And nothing shows Lucas's insight into Marx's ideas better than the fact that he did not know the Grand Ries when he wrote his own book. Although Marx does not say so, it is obvious that this consciousness exceeding its bounds is not identical with the empirical 
consciousness of the working class. It is not consciousness of misery and still less of poverty in the narrow sense. The needs which flow from it, of which constitute its base, are not directed towards greater possession and still less towards higher wages or a better standard of living. It is the simple consciousness of alienation, the recognition that the social relations are alienated. From this there follows, or this constitutes the base for, the need to overcome alienation, to overturn the alienated social and productive relations in a revolutionary way, and to create general social and productive relations which are not alienated. As yet, history has not answered the question as to whether capitalist society in fact produces this consciousness exceeding its bounds, which in Marx's day did not exist, and whose existence Marx therefore had to project.